feel the need the weekly episode uh 18 and uh we are back this week with our usual uh host of characters starting off on my far left will be your far right while you're watching is mr juan Magnell from some gadget guy how's it going man hey going well man got my coffee i'm ready chat all right cool and next up is mr sam aka black iron underscore man how's it going man hi everyone all right, and finally, rounding up the quartet is the one and only Warren Bowman from BW1.com. <sighs> Let's do this. It's Saturday, and you have shades on that lets you look like a douche. <laughs> wow, coming in. Wow. So what you guys don't know is that yeah. we had an extended heated uh, sports ball conversation <laughs> before we uh. went live. And, and I think some things were said that we can't take back. I don't nah, think we'll be nah, unburned. Nah, nah. Mm. Why, do you, why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw it in somehow. He doesn't <laughs> want the baby. He doesn't <laughs> want the baby. Like, he doesn't <laughs> want it. Anyway, let's get back to tech, guys. If you're listening, um, we have a light show, but it should be a fun show this week. Uh, anyone in the chat, anyone who has a useless list, let me know. Um, but I think, uh, Sam, you just sent one over. No, um, it's uh, something to discuss if possible. It's about uh, Spotify revokes policy to punish artists accused of bad behavior. Yeah, I found this one interesting when Spotify first uh, announced this um, yeah. policy. And I was like, at first I was like, yeah, cool. Then I realized that all artists have bad behavior at the same time. So I wasn't like, I guess for me, just me, it was like, okay, you know, the artists I've loved over the years, I listened to, you know, what I think of something like Ozzy Osbourne. If Ozzy was, you know, in his prime now, doing all the stiff stuff that he did, he would fail on this, you Is know. Is he alive? No, he's alive. I'm just saying that if he was in his prime. Are we sure? I think Ozzy has done enough uh, drugs to basically preserve himself forever. He's <laughs> yeah, he's like a Keith Richards at this point. Yeah. yeah. Oh, way past that. Keith yeah, Richards. Past that. I, think, I think the key comment here is uh, Spotify going, um, our role is not to regulate artists. And I believe that's a really good idea. They should leave it up to the labels. They should leave it up to the management companies. Um, look at what happened, not to jump into the whole Roseanne thing. It was between ABC and her management company that ended up dropping her. You know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be basically um, people like uh, Spotify who basically pays these other companies for rights, for streaming rights or whatever for the song. Spotify is just a service where it's being thrown on there. If you have bad behavior, Spotify shouldn't be the police. It should be up to the people who own I'll the labels. I'll, 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 cause I agree with you, Sam, but I do want to throw out just, uh, for the sake of conversation and argument, like, let's say you were a radio station and you ran into an R Kelly situation or a Chris Brown situation. The management of that radio station would have a say in what makes it to air. You know, we do have these sort of guidelines in place for how we promote certain individuals, uh, movies for the same token, you know, movies can get pulled, TV shows can get canceled and you're right that it happens between certain en entities. But Spotify now blurs the line for what we would traditionally look for in that relationship. Spotify is like a radio service. So at some point, they should be able to have a say as to what's broadcast on their service. True, but... Uh, like, it's a complicated... It, 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 like, <laughs> I, I think what they did was ham-fisted and was mm -hmm. a dumb way to approach it. But at the, you know, to the same token, I do believe they should have some say over what parts of what catalogs they have on their on their uh, platform but with the whole idea of spotify with the, the functionality of spotify i can specify who i don't want uh, uh, to show up on my playlist mm -hmm. yeah. so i think that kind of removes spotify from the responsibility of a radio station because it gives a lot more control to the users so i would say if you're a user of these services and you, you encounter an artist that is reprehensible that is basically that doesn't fit into your social or um you know, your, your worldview, you can just opt out of that artist. And I right. think Spotify finally realized that, that we do have that option for our users. So why are okay. we ahead and doing something else? But but then also, we, we also exist in a climate where people are very hair triggery and to see uh, uh, that you can get R. Kelly on Spotify. Well, I'm going to boycott Spotify is yeah. going to be a Tumblr conversation it, if it's not already. Uh, that I'm sure Spotify management would also be concerned about. I, I think their policy was misguided. I think it was poorly implemented. And I think 
they they saw the repercussions of what was going down. I, I think this was the right move to to reverse course on this. But I also think, you know, if if something truly terrible comes out from one of these artists, not just the sort of permissive bad behavior that we're willing to accept from a celebrity, but beyond the pale, I don't think it's completely uh, com completely out, out, outside the realm of of good business for Spotify to still say like, you know, like we'll take everyone, but that guy, cause that guy sucks. So we're going to pull that guy from our, from our catalog. Yeah, no, I, I do agree on that aspect of them having that ability to jump in and say that, but you know, the initial policy of saying, no, no, here's our guidelines and you must go to church every Sunday and you must do this <laughs> uh, before you actually cut a record right. and put on Spotify. Yeah, that, that, was doesn't, dumb. that doesn't work. <laughs> you know, like anything, again, it's just the same reaction like ABC had is saying, look, we don't like what you said. You don't like what you're doing. No, nope, sorry, done. Because you, you've at least affected something where a large number of our user base will not, you know, would not like. So I think on that aspect, but uh, Warren, what about you? What do you think? Well, I think the, uh, the the best reaction for them to do is to take it on a case by case basis. I don't really think there's a way to make a blanket sort of statement in, in, in terms of how, how you handle these sort of, uh, I guess, uh, social situations or, or uh, PR situations when an artist isn't doing something that's favorable. I think the best thing that they could do is, is, is adjust algorithms to maybe not allow that artist to be seen as much within within their systems as often when those type of things kind of sort of happen. If they're running a promotion from that artist to stop their promotion during that time, you know, that might be some good things that they can do from from, from that aspect. But I think they, the, the, the seeing what they put down first, saw that it wasn't a good idea and going back and reversing it, was is a good sign and a good thing that they're well they're, that they're aware that their initial re re response to this was not the best response to have, and I I think it really has to be a case by case this, this thing it just got to be it's it's got to depend. Um, it, 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 you know, the funny thing is I think I think TV deals with this a lot more than 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 music does because music at the end of the day will just play a song on the radio and it is what it is um, unless that artist is like literally like. I don't know because there hasn't been anybody that terrible yet because R. <laughs> Kelly, because R. Kelly seems to get away with everything, and that's probably the, you'd figure he would have like pushed the bar well, at I some point. The, would, the, would, the, would, would we would we maybe draw a corollary with uh, with the performer like CeeLo Green? Is is that in the ballpark? Because I think that the response and the backlash to CeeLo Green was not career ending, but definitely like career decimating. I, 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 I don't know with CeeLo, I think also again, CeeLo was not as, CeeLo to me is not as big as Art Kelly. Um, no, just I think terms, what, I'm yeah. not saying what, in what they did, I mean in the response to what they no, did. No, 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 just in so. catalog even. I mean like Art Kelly had so many hits, CeeLo had right. like a couple and CeeLo was more on TV or, or is at it the that, time. That, that we, we were able to come down harder on CeeLo Green because he isn't as big an influence as the catalog and history of R. Kelly. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. more money. But, uh, you but, can't come hard on him. But I think also you have to add the fact that CeeLo was on TV. Yeah. TV is the place where they can nail you. You know, TV's, he was TV's, TV's the bigger TV's the bigger thing. It's it, it seeing more people are affected more by seeing than seeing. hearing. So they, 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 TV just like this, this type of stuff all you know, you, you do something on TV, you go hide. Like, you hide for a while, <laughs> oh, yeah. and then you come back. You know, you come back and you do your apology tour. Right. But that's like at least a year and a half, way, you know, before you even start making those ventures. On the radio, you know, the, you know on radio or, or streaming services, the most apology tour you go to is like, you know, one of the big radio stations or one of those big DJs that you go and talk to and just drop an apology track. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then you explain no, no they don't, nobody drops yeah, apology, tracks drops apology tracks. Yeah, anymore. you just you just kinda explain that you were in a down moment in your life and well, you, you, you you try to get on the breakfast club or you try to get exactly on yeah and then then it's gone. radio talk shows and try to talk and speak your mind and be interviewed and you know pull the Chris Brown so to speak. Because yeah. because he should have he should have of all people then should have should have have caught that hammer. But yeah. Music, the music industry allows as much nonsense as it, as it possibly can allow, as long as tracks are spinning. So, so I think Spotify handling a case by case is probably the the best thing. And 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 being a streaming service that it's not <clears throat> that isn't um, isn't as tied to the rules as radio is in terms of uh, 
its business model, it could, it could, it could possibly have more, it could possibly do more things in terms of, of, um, being flexible, being flexible because the radio station only has the radio station is limited to time, time. And it, it could only play so many songs so many times per day and it fit advertising in within that Spotify has an unlimited amount of time because it's all times dependent upon the user and they have a, a, on a number of songs that are unlimited to it too. So if one artist doesn't like something or does something wrong, they can just, all right, well, we'll just, you know, we can make money by promoting another artist or another artist comes in and, and it takes that space that this artist didn't have before. So yeah. well, and then I think this also is indicative of the fact that Spotify probably overestimated their power in this instance in being the streaming service and, and in how much money actually makes it from Spotify back to publishers uh, and labels and the artist. I, I think they grossly overestimated how much control they'd be able to exert over the music industry. Yeah, no, I would agree. Let's uh, let's move on to our topics. Unless there's any more uselessness you guys have or in the chat, let us know. Uh, we'll come back to it. Uh, moving on to uh, some uh, future rumors for devices either coming at the end of the year. I dubbed it the iPhone X1 because I don't know what they're going to call it. Or XI, sorry. Um, the, the rumor is from Korea Herald, uh, which claims that both the Galaxy S10 and the new iPhone uh, uh, XI Plus or X Plus, whatever it would be, will feature three camera lenses. Three. Um, isn't clear what the third sensor would be exactly for Apple. Uh, we do know that Huawei was the first company to throw three, three lenses. And of course, one is a dedicated monochrome lens, which is something you'll be doing for a while. But uh, just to, to guess, what do you think Apple or Samsung, if they were to throw three lenses in, would be that fed lens for what, what do you think it would be because i don't think it would be monochrome i don't think that's something they would go with but uh sam what do you think uh here in the article it's saying it's probably going to be for uh, enhanced zoom um thinking... i said you i didn't say article i know okay. what the article if said you, if you if you let me finish you would have heard exactly <laughs> what i was going to say <laughs> I, I think it might be for um something like more related to just like AR, VR kind of stuff. Like, so basically augmented reality. So they would have the two cameras like they have right now, and they might have a, something for enhanced depth of field or something that basically gives you more of a 3D feel to things when you're going around using AR. That would be ideal in, my, uh, in, in any situation, given the way VR is going right now. The fact that you could probably throw this into one of those, um, you know, Samsung Gear VR type devices where the back is open and you're basically viewing some kind of AR kind of experience in real time, walking around, being able to use your camera and also have the AR experience. I would hope that's what they're going for because AR and VR are pretty big right now. But ultimately, you can't really tell because a third camera is <laughs> like something that we've only seen, like you said, on the, on the um, what was it the P20? Yeah, P20 Pro. It'd be interesting to find out what they do with it. No, I, I agree with Sam. I think it would be entirely way too practical for them to put something on that actually is a benefit just for normal photo and video, like yeah. <laughs> like a wide angle camera, LG style. I seriously doubt they're going to do anything that beneficial to the consumer. Instead, I think every company right now is doubling down on AI, machine learning, the, the, the sort of fads of the moment right now. I think it, it probably will push towards some kind of uh, depth sensor. What's hilarious is getting back to like Project Tango style hardware, where if we had just started incorporating that from the get go, then we wouldn't have to reinvent this wheel for future AR services. Uh, Warren? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I might imagine the AR VR kind of aspect of it is probably one of the things that they'll be doing. Um, it'll maybe benefit pictures, but I think we'll find a lot of diminishing returns sort of come into play the more we sort of add those things out there because remember at the end of the day consumers mm -hmm. are just posting to facebook and instagram they're not posting to everywhere else like we like 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 the rest of us are um or not even yeah. just posting i mean like missing out on opportunities like i'm creating prints yeah. <laughs> like i did a giant a, a large format canvas print of my daughter playing in a fountain that i took off the hip from uh from my v30 like if 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 consumers were really playing around with stuff like that, I think we'd probably see smartphone manufacturers more in the realm of what Huawei is doing, like really trying to improve that photo video experience 
really trying to up the ante, but that's that's not where I think the folk the main focus is headed. And you can learn how to do that more by reading Juan's book, <laughs> taking better photos, <laughs> not from photography with news. Out now. <laughs> On on it's, it's, it's available on Amazon. You can download the ebook. <laughs> you should do the audiobook one. You should do the audiobook. Recording one. I, re- I, I, I really said, I think a, a photography audiobook is the worst idea ever. No, no, no. no, no, no. It's, it's the best sell. idea. It's the best idea. Call sell. us in. We'll be the guest actors and be like, hey, Juan, I'm trying to take a picture, but I can't get my friends to stay still. How do I capture them all in the perfect environment? That's and you're hilarious. like, and we're trying to change, like, change the S style value, and we'll go. Which is the S stop value on this particular device? How do I get there, Juan? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. You just rocked my world. We're gonna do. It. Um, Anil says adding a depth sensor and a wide angle will allow AR to push even more boundaries. Uh, although more developers, um, more developers also need to invest resources in developing apps. I mean, developers developing anything that costs more money is not what developers do. So, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I, I would like to see a depth and wide angle uh, sensor. Combine, I mean, like those two, and yes, it will boost AR, but it means that every phone would have a wide angle sensor for Juan, so at least you would have that there. So, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, but actually, we'll see. off the back of that comment, right? Has any developer really, like any third party developer, used, um, you know, um, the iPhone X's AR feature for, you know, any apps out there? Have you guys encountered anything like that? Because I haven't really um, heard much about that. One, there's so there's one that um, my uh, my friend who I do the photography video with was showing me. I can't remember the name. It's a camera. It's a it's a bokeh app. It just basically does better bokehs than the iPhone can do. That's one thing. It literally looks it looks really close to your to your mirrorless or DSLR. Like that's how good it looks. But it also does a different. You can also now do a 3D depth sensing thing with it, so you can actually start rotating it and still get the full depth, almost as a 3D image. It's really cool and very interesting. It's very different. Uh, approach to it where you can actually rotate the image and see the layer of depth because then it's taking all the images that are stitched and it's now like giving you all the layers out the way through. So if you're looking at a flower, you're getting a full three dimensional cut slice on one half of it. This is using, which is something that, um, again, surprising because I was, well, I was talking to him and I said, you know, yeah, this is what the iPhone can do. The air tech they have in there and the camera sensors that they have is pretty good. It's just that, you know, whenever we take a bokeh photo, it's hit or miss. I would say it's four out of four out of ten that you get, you know, a really solid looking image. So I don't know if you guys agree with me or not, but um, it's funny that, you know, somebody else is doing that better with an app on the iPhone, I think. Yeah, well, and then also it's um like a lot of the apps for AR core. One of the problems that we're running into, like I'm doing a Google search right now while we're talking about this, and it's really difficult to just get a list of ar core compatible apps on google play (laughs) yeah like that just doesn't exist like if you wanted people to really be taking advantage and you wanted developers to think that you were supporting this initiative maybe just have i don't know ar core by google.com and have a list like we were trying to do with you know cardboard you know make it a project that people can actually find with a simple uh, web, it's, it's not it's not even, it's, it's not even that easy to find AR. I think I think Apple does a much better dub, job with it on the uh, on the uh, Apple totally Store. There's an AR. AR section. It's just purely yeah. one section for AR Kit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and on Android, like you, you have to know the game or the app, unless you're on on the VR headset where it's just purely AR stuff there. But on your phone, if you're just trying to go like, let me find something so I can, you know, either save or, or come back later to download. Like, it's just, it's a hot mess. So I, I would say, I mean, some of the more successful things have just been, I, I think they're still in the realm of demo more than they are hardcore, real practical. But um, who was it? Lowe's, their app actually functions pretty well if you want yeah. to like place furniture and measure your room and do some stuff where you could, uh, you could try and imagine what, some new stuff in your living room would look like it's still fairly limited but i think it's a huge step in the right direction bmw uh, bmw oh, okay. um has a really interesting ar service there's an iphone game which is way more fun than it has any right to be 
<laughs> where you have to go out into a big old wide field and you look like an idiot holding your phone up in front of your face, but it draws out a course and you have to run the course in AR <laughs> and then it times you and it puts up your time against people around the world. And I can't even remember what it's called. I want to say it's something dumb like AR Runner or something like that. But but it's I I, I lost so many times. <laughs> and like this is again, it's it's like Beat Saber for VR. It's like this is way more fun than it has any any right to be. And I'm running around this empty soccer field like an idiot. But I'm I'm having fun doing it. So I mean, some things like that I think could be really exciting if. If we could give this a little bit more visibility, give it more of a push, I don't think we get there just from hardware manufacturers building in new proprietary triple camera systems. But I'm seeing some stuff that's really encouraging. And especially if we could get um, older services on board, like I would love to have a Pokemon Go where when the showdown happens, your Pokemon characters actually interact with the environment, you know. Like really building. So like I'm out at a, again, I'm out at a park and I'm gonna duel with your with your character and there's a park bench in there and they can jump on and off the park bench and they actually can interact with each other. That'll be really exciting. And I think that's something Apple's working on for their next generation of um, AR kit mm -hmm. is two iPhones in the same place talking to each other so that those types of interactive experiences match up. And so that you're looking at the same thing from different angles and the phones are relating that information back to each other in space. Again, I think that's another positive step in the right direction. The, the one thing I would say in the AR and VR arena, which to me is shocking because I'm not a fan of uh, low end uh, VR stuff. I've really enjoyed the Oculus Go. Don't ask me why, um, but it's... Uh, I realized there's a lot of, you know, I can see where Juan was going with this. Maybe I, I finally caught the vision that you had at like low end VR. Um, but it, it just reminded me because I was using, I've been using it for at least, you know, two or three weeks now. Uh, I mean, half the time is just watching movies, just the fact that I have that theater experience um, nice. with it. And it, you know, it's actually got speakers built in. So I'd actually need to use headphones all the time. Uh, but then uh, I think it was a couple of days ago, Qualcomm announced their, which I find interesting because I would rather see a lot of, I mean, a lot of these features are in the Snapdragon 845, but some of them are not. And I would like to see these features in. So they announced the XR1 platform, which is basically purely VR, AR chipsets, or at least tuned chipsets. You know, the standards of 4K, the Spectra, but the advanced vision processing, which is not in any of the 845s or the 820s, or any of that kind of stuff. The spatial 3D audio, which you need in, in AR and VR because you're getting that, um, like, you know, sound awareness and and then also like the the depth sensors and things like that. So I'd rather just see this in all your chipsets moving forward because... AR and VR is not just going to be limited to just the standalone headsets. You're going to have it in, you know, different devices. And if you're going to push on this boundaries, then it's best that at least all your flagship chipsets should support all these features. Yeah. Um, and or unless maybe, of course, because they call it a platform, maybe it's the platform will include some of those flagship uh, processors. They haven't really specified, but... It will be interesting to see how that uh, turns out because it looks like uh, VR and AR is, is is getting back into that mainstream push again um, with you know a couple of these new releases and launches. So, you know, we should. Uh, but again, it's about standards. It's about mm -hmm. making sure that you've got a broad swath of compatibility, and then it's also about discoverability. Which right now Apple's doing better, but I don't. I don't even think Apple's solution is really. Uh, going to be moving the needle for general consumers. Yeah, I, I would agree. All right, moving uh, forward, uh, it looks like uh, Samsung plans to revamp his camera and unveil the Galaxy Note 9 on August 9th. That is way too early. <laughs> yeah, it's never too early to announce or to release um, the, the new notes. Okay, Sam, you're frozen and you've got this death stare to the camera right now. Oh, I am frozen. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, Warren, what do you, what do you think? So look they like talk about rap album, Sam. Yeah, yeah. it does look good. Yeah, it does. So uh, according to the the article here from Bloomberg, says they're, they're going to focus on camera system, um, 
uh, faster processor, which means the new Exynos is coming out, um, which we knew that was coming. But they are talking about the camera system, which I think they do need to update their processing and also the front facing camera, which is something they just haven't updated in a while. What do you think, uh, uh, Warren? Um, interesting. They're, they're, I mean, it makes sense to, with, with the note to focus on the cameras more because you have more space to be able to do these type of things. And hopefully they, they will try to push it out as more of that premium high end smartphone that sort of has all the best specs that it used to have like back in the day. So it'd be nice to, for them to do that. Um, they have to get somewhere on the ball with the front facing camera because uh, you're seeing everyone else push their the limits of the front facing camera. There's more. And Samsung has really sort of just kind of just kind of try to keep up a, a, a little bit. But I think they need to make a drastic change to join the rest of the uh, movement out there in terms of uh, front facing camera work. Um, but that seems to be the main thing that we can focus on. Most of these uh, smartphones right now is the better camera. And so I'm not surprised the notes focus is probably going to be more on that than probably any of the other features that they that they'll update with it going forward. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what about you? Uh, I was going to say Sam, but he's in and out. Um, Mark, how about you? I mean, it's the same. I like. I want to see the Note return to being a Vanguard product. You, know, you guys have heard me win John enough about this. I, I want the Note to be the tech showcase. I want the Note to be the unquestionable. This is how far we can push the boundaries of a smartphone design. And and I understand why from the Note 7 to the Note 8, we probably needed a recovery year in there, but we've got to get back on track. I, I don't I don't think I've I, I don't think I've been as impressed in any smartphone generational increase in improvement as I was going from the Note 3 to the Note 4. I, I want to have that feeling again where I really felt like this is something special. This is something that is really pushing every single technology I care about and every single experience that it's it's claiming to offer, it's dominating. Um, and that's what I want. That's what I want from a Samsung. And more often than not, I'm uh, lately I've been I've been more looking forward to the active because I just want a Samsung with a bigger battery. You know, like that that's where I've been most excited about their releases. The thing that has me concerned is uh, not only just the the talking points about what kind of tech they're putting into it, but the, the potential that they might be shifting this timeline around again because they're talking about trying to make the phone thinner. And that's something I don't think any note fan really cares about is having the thinnest possible note. It's that we want to see a tech, a dominating tech platform. See, I, I think I think that is also I think that's just a misconception from Bloomberg and whoever's reporting this, because I think they're going to the fact that because Samsung is looking at having uh, an acoustic style speaker that's vibrating off the screen, mm-hmm. um, that they're thinking Samsung wants to make it thinner. I think Samsung just wants to do that. And in the result, it's going to be thinner, no matter how you look at it. So I mean, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily tied together, but we'll see. Because well, again, but, if, but even know. if you include that tech, I don't think any note person is going to say, "Oh, good, you you built in an acoustic vibrational or tissue conducting screen. Now you can make the phone thinner." Like what they would say, I, I think more often people would say, "Like, why can't we get a note with a battery that at least matches the S nine plus?" No, no. What I'm saying is, I think the they got it wrong. I think they just want to make it thin. I mean, they want to make the the uh, the acoustic sound of the speaker, and I think they are assuming, aka, okay, who wrote this, mm-hmm. assuming that that's what Samsung is is correlating the two together. I just don't see it that way because I think we're going to go up to a much larger. There've been also previous reports that my Samsung is looking at increasing the battery of the Note anyway the last couple of months so i don't to me i just don't think that's the case i think it's just that samsung has a new piece of tech with a screen that they want to throw in and then that's it and they just assume it but then again i could be wrong we'll have to wait to see till august something right 9th 31st you know, something like that sam how about you uh, I, um, i'm not as excited about the camera as uh, i'm sure a lot of people would be I think yes, it is due for an upgrade because uh, there have been a lot of advances in uh, in handheld cameras, or should I say, in um, phone cameras, and mobile cameras that um, the Note has somewhat missed out on, especially the phone facing camera. I would be more excited to hear more about what they want to do with Dex and how that's going to factor in to um, the new Note Nine. 
But overall, any upgrade to the Note, bringing it to be that flagship um, slash experimental cutting edge device is always welcome. See, I, I believe we're going to get three major updates to the notes, and they're not going to be that big. They're going to get improve the front-facing camera, and they're probably going to improve their camera system, their processing system. Um, they're also going to improve uh, the S Pen. That's just going to get that constant update. So maybe you know some more features and writing better, and then we'll get that you know uh, acoustic surface uh, speaker, maybe a slightly bigger battery. Because the biggest, again, to me, the biggest upgrades for any of the Galaxy line comes in 20, you know, 19. That's next year, right? 2019, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's when we have the Galaxy S10 and the Note 10. You, you got to save it for then. Like, you can't do everything this year, which is, which to me, leads me to believe that it's not, this, this, this whole acoustic sounding um, uh, display is just so that they have something extra because they're saving everything for next year. To me, that's just how I, I see it with Samsung. You know, well, well, know. The, well, the Note 10 is going to come personalized with Sam's face on it. <laughs> it's going to be the Sam edition because he's the so biggest I, fan. So, I, I mean, I know um, Bloomberg picked this up too, but um, there's a thebell.co.kr is actually, I mean, I, this is all speculation. This isn't, you know, hard fact, but... Yeah. Um, Samsung Electronics has made a design change to reduce the thickness of the glass of the new Galaxy Note 9 by 0.5 T, 0.5 millimeters, compared to the existing plan. The window glass protects the OLED panel from film-like parts that stick to the outermost side of the phone. So, again, it looks like we could be seeing the, the glass sandwich. Where, where the Galaxy S9 is scoring not great for durability is the durability of those glass parts, them actually finding ways to make that glass even thinner on the phone that's supposed to be the, the more brutal lifestyle, getting to done productivity phone. Hmm. All right. Again, that's, that's, that's a take it with a giant rock of salt. <laughs> but I, again, I, if, if this turns out, like if we see during the press conference and like, yeah, we're Samsung and we know what you want, you want a thinner note, um, I, I will be the first to start crying and whinging on Twitter that Samsung doesn't know what we want with the note. I mean, if they give us a thinner note and a bigger battery in there, would you be happy? No, I, again, the, the part of this will be I want a note that I don't feel I need to handle with kid gloves. And so you made the phone 0.5 millimeters thinner so that I will then have to add 0.5 millimeters of protective thickness to whatever case I need to put it on where I can still get my note four. And that thing has never been in a case. And I have been brutal to that phone. And it, I mean, it's scratched to hell, but it's, it's fine. It's fine. No, as opposed no, to like no my case. Note Five, which slid out of a pocket and landed from like waist height onto <sighs> asphalt and no, destroyed no. everything on the inside. That, that, the sorry, I'm sorry, Juan. That was your fault. I I do not. Oh, yeah, use, yeah, yeah, yeah. I in, do in not my, use a case awesome on this productivity phone. Just never drop it. And when and when the peasants run out of bread, just let them eat cake. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't use a case on this because Sam has my case. That's really the truth, not the fact that I actually don't use a case. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do have his case. Stealing his case now. Yeah, no, because no, no. my phone cracked while I had my case on, so I had to fix someone else's <laughs> case. So you know, I took it. <laughs> so I was like, "Oh, this case is much better." I was like, "Yeah, yeah, you can have it. It's fine. It's okay. I'll sacrifice, sacrifice my phone." But anyway, um, that would be interesting. But I don't think the launch date is August 9th. Uh, I think that's just too... I, there, I mean, I, I don't even know if the August 9th. There were some early rumors that we'd see at the end of July. So, yeah. uh, you know, get, getting getting into August now even seems like that might be reasonable. No, um, but here, Here's why I think it's just not. Every single year, they do the same game. Every single year, mm -hmm. Samsung launches this one or two days before EVA. Really? Yeah. Like always, every year. I don't think they launch it until the week before Eva. Yeah. It, to best. me, to me, it's 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 always the same thing. Um, and then there's a report that they said, uh, at least from Korea, that um, uh, an exec says they will delay the launch for two weeks. That's not a report. It hasn't been confirmed or denied, but uh, because they're making changes. So if you're making changes, it's going to be delayed, not pushed up. To me, it makes sense to actually go in 
closer now, to I wonder, I wonder if Samsung will pull an LG where they announce a phone that then takes like six weeks for it to actually make it to market. Nah, that is not Samsung. We know that. Is I not. know that's not Samsung. That's what I'm saying is like if they're going through the process, if, if some of these uh, media speculation, if some of this is true, that they're redesigning parts of a phone that's supposed to launch this year. I wonder if they'll hold to their IFA timeline. There, let's 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 screw up everybody's travel plans before flying off to Germany by also making you fly to New York. And uh, but we won't really actually have the phone mass produced until you know, like a month or a month and a half afterwards. Uh, no, I don't think that that's that's the Samsung. Samsung doesn't play with money like that that they want to get. <laughs> but they're not going to hold the announcement until after IFA. Yeah, will they? Um, I, I don't know. We, again, it's just rumors and speculations, but I think we will know soon enough. Once Samsung tells us we, they're making an announcement, we'll know soon enough, and usually it's two weeks after. They've joined the Apple fray of two weeks. I remember they, they I, and again, they, their redesigning here, I think, is not a redesign of we're changing too much. We have to now move certain things. Remember, remember this redesign with this, this button. This was last minute also because it was supposed to be here with the fingerprint sensor. They had to move it around, and it still launched in the same window they were supposed to, because uh, Synaptex couldn't get it to work, and it's taking them still a year and a half, and it's still not working correctly. So, I think I think it's moving things around or placing things in specific areas so that it actually, you know, fits properly. But we'll see. We'll see. Speaking of redesign and uh, complete sexy look. Uh, mm -hmm. Lenovo on uh, June twelfth will be announcing the Z five, which is will have probably one of the thinnest bezels of any phone. Except I wish they just move that camera to the top. I don't know why it's on the bottom. I, I don't get it. That's that's just the only thing. I'm like, you, you so just I, I actually. So my thing is, I actually do like having a chin mm -hmm. bezel for how it it positions your keyboard. And that you don't have to have a ton of like wasted software digital bezel to make up for trying to reach the bottom edge. I actually so the thing that I complained about in a video that I produced in 2013 when people were complaining about bezels, I'm starting to run into on phones like the G7 and the OnePlus 6, where I've got a couple older games that I really like to play that they probably won't they won't be able to become properly calibrated for these super tall skinny aspect ratio screens and when you've got these controls that are at the the barest edges of the phones like my thumbs can't can't play a game like this at their minimum flexible distance from the pad of my hand for very long um so i i'd kind of like to have some border space where we can kind of arrange parts and pieces uh i this the Z5 looks awesome as a design piece. Uh, you know, we're gonna have a selfie camera that looks up your nose, just like laptops with low mounted webcams. But I, I don't, I don't mind having this dead space on the the front face of a phone, just for the ergonomics of how you're using it in different orientations. Anyone else, Warren? Uh, I'm only I'm I, I, I said Warren. Oh, oh Sam, Sam can go ahead. He already started. Sorry right. about that. Fine, I'm, Sam. Saying, I'm mostly concerned with like fingerprints on the camera um, side of things. Like, yeah. Because it's closer to your hands now. It's closer to where you access your library. It's closer to where you hit the home button. So it's close to where you probably even launch the camera. So you're going to have a lot of thumbprints on that area. How would that affect like camera quality? Every time you have to take a take a picture now you're cleaning why well, every time you have to take a, a selfie you're cleaning you know your the chin of your phone it's just it'd be interesting to see how that works yeah out. that that takes away that takes away, away time from that selfie game and you know how people are just they roll hard on that stuff man so i mean i don't know what do you think warren uh um and I, I always I always found rear mounting to be pretty weird as well to or i'm not rear mounting on bottom mounting to be just i i, I don't i don't I, I, is this some type of weird like I don't it's just it's confusing in all ways like I'm not sure like what to say is like if I see that I, I, I bring up that J.R. Smith confused face that's just kind of what I have when looking at this it's just like I'm not sure if I should you know take the selfie or just like maybe run it across the line instead I don't know but it's just I don't know it's 
the, the the phone itself looks really nice. It looks sleek. It looks uh, it looks like it's going to be a pretty nice looking phone that might not ever show up here in the U.S. But it probably won't. But um, that the rear mounted camera is uh, I mean, rear mount key rear mounted bottom mounted bottom mounted Wait, cameras is, is just kind how, of confusing. How far away do you think we we are from being able to mount a front facing camera without a border on it? Because that's one of the things that's like basically underneath the display itself. No, right? no, no, no. So I mean, like you would have to have a circle cut out in the display, right? yeah. But not having it, because look at like the essential. I think the essential is the one that's gotten close. So you've got that bar, and then the selfie camera sits under that black bar. It's the widow's peak in the middle of the screen. How long? How far away do you think we are from just getting rid of that mounting hardware? So all you have is just the circle cutout of the camera. Because then I think if it's living in your notification shade, that's far less disruptive than a notch. Um, I think I think we're not even going to get there. I think we're going to just go, it's going to be flush underneath the display. I think that's where they're working to, faster than I, that. I think I, they, I, they're I, skipping that round and going. I think we're going to have issues there because the you're going to put image visual imagery hardware on top of a camera sensor and how do you light those pixels like they, they won't match the rest of the display anyway so i mean like i think that's an acceptable compromise if if we can't get this properly under the display with a display that's not interrupted so like those pixels are still usable then just cut those pixels out but don't give us all of this disrupting hardware that goes along with it. Just make it that simple camera circle without everything else that has to be bordering it. Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree, but I, I, I don't know. You know, like, I'm not the engineer. I don't know. This, why are you asking me these questions, man? Well, I think we're just all confused by this phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can't come up with anything... No. Any use cases for Any it. Any use right? cases, yeah. and we all keep, and I keep saying rear facing when it's like at the bottom, and it just like. Oh. Well, maybe, maybe, um, maybe uh, Vivo is the one. Uh, so I didn't have it up here, but Vivo, the Vivo Next, which is the Apex, pretty much is that's yeah. what it's going to be. It's going to have the periscope or the pop out camera, but that one is truly going to be. Um, uh, I won't call it bezel-less, but the least amount of bezel you would find on any. Well, and, and also, I'm, I'm super excited to be seeing these screen speaker technologies coming back. Uh, the, tissue, the tissue conduction uh, feature that you had on a phone like the Kyocera Brigadier was phenomenal. Like, it's, it's bothered me that you know, a, a, a sort of a budget brand like Kyocera gave us a sapphire display with tissue conducting screen in a in a phone that was just brutally rugged and no major mainstream manufacturer has picked up on any of that well that you brought know, some you, serious tech to, to to the phone experience you know I, I one of the things i i think that happened is because um in terms of mass production levels for that i'm not saying that it was either cheap or expensive because la this past cs i got to see, i got to talk to uh, lg display and they showed their display with um, uh, tissue conduction as well as also acoustic vibration on mm -hmm. there. And it wasn't that they showed it. it. It sounded fantastic and great, but they just they basically said, we can throw this on anything, anytime. So I think it was just the ability to actually do it on a large scale that it was just, it becomes more beneficial for a company to say, okay, I'll pick that up and use it as opposed to back then where there probably were a few things or workarounds you had to do just to make sure you got it right. So I think we have the point where now it's like, hey, yeah, if you want it, we can do it. We're all just confused by this phone. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be taking pictures and holding your phone on the, on the top side. Uh, because if you hold it on the, on the on the bottom side, the potential of you basically just like messing up that shot. How do you even handle that? Yeah. Thing? How do you have a video I, call? How do you have? A I, video I was gonna call? say. I mean, if all you need is a little bit of custom software in there, I, I mean, you guys remember Alcatel had the screen flip. Oh you my know, god! If you want to videos, you could use the phone upside down. I don't know why you'd want to, but you can. So you just do that. Although, so, so use the phone as it's supposed to be used. <laughs> Except the camera, with the, the other way and all that. Uh, BF what, what, says, what about the Instagram videos? How, how is that even going to work? 
Look, I don't think they're thinking about that right now. Yeah, this I, is coming from China because I think this is going to be more for China. Yeah, it's oh, not. This just needs to support WeChat, so that's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, BF Lloyd said, hated chin bezels until, until Juan made earth moving sense just now. Even though uh, I guess he has, you know, he's just like he with hobbit hands. He's probably thinking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No that. offense, BF Lloyd. But, but but this is this is one of those things. Like I I think tech enthusiasts will knee jerk themselves into something that sucks. Like uh, what people were bitching about the iPhone 10 keyboard. Look at all this bottom wasted space. Why can't I put some controls there? Why can't you dock my emojis there? Because then you'd be trying to reach the very bottomest edge of a slippery all glass screen. Apple was right. You no. need dead space there to push the camera up for where you actually hold the phone. So I don't I'm not bothered by a little a little extra screen bezel. Our phones are not immersive. They're not immersive is wearing a headset or sitting in front of a TV or sitting really close to a movie theater screen, wrapping a display around your head, a really nice gaming curved monitor. That's immersive. Our phones are little. So it's okay. If there's a little frame on that phone, it's fine. It really is. Oh yeah. Right. We don't um, need to make everything bezel-less. And Neil said transparent OLEDs would still do the trick there. I, but, but, I mean, have you seen them? Because they're not truly transparent. Oh, they are. They're, they're no, they're not. They're not crystal. And oh, well, they're not that, crystal, that, but they're they're close. They're enough. close, right? But we're talking about people who are fixated <laughs> on taking pictures of themselves with a lower grade camera. <laughs> so you're already degrading the camera sensitivity by putting that in front, and then also the max output of a transparent OLED does not match what you can do when you put a back on that OLED. Because you also need something for the light to direct. Oh yeah, so yeah. truly transparent doesn't really work. No, no, it's kind of like when you when you're not hand. using the camera, you ionize the screen, and then it forms this <laughs> ionized layer behind. This is all sci-fi shit. Talking <laughs> yeah, about. I was just saying they can't even do that on like a vending. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be able to do that on a phone. <laughs> 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 you just ionize the back, man, and you just throw in, you know. Um, you know what, I, what I need is like a little card. So I'll just put a little black card <laughs> at the top of the phone whenever I'm not using the selfie camera, and I'll just pull it out whenever exactly. I want to use the selfie exactly. camera. No, I mean, I've seen people in, in, the, in the chat saying transparent OLED and stuff like that. But, but my, my point is you would still have a significant difference in those pixels standing out from the rest of the phone anyway, and they're going to be in a location which is often dead space. The middle of your notification bar is often dead space. So instead of having this big screen cutout, the, the, the halfway point, the evolutionary step should be get rid of the big black bar cutout and only put in the circle cutouts that you absolutely need, and that's far less disruptive to what we currently have. That, that's my step. Until we can get to some point where we could maybe mount a camera directly under active screen space, because then I'd want that camera to be in the center of the screen. Mm -hmm. Line up my video chat so I can make eye contact with the person I'm talking to. Don't put the camera at the top of the phone. Put it in the middle of the phone. And that would be awesome. But we're still way far away from being able to make a display that can do that. We're, uh, just, we're just really confused by this phone. <laughs> Listen, I don't want no weird, like, I don't want anything weird looking like this unless this is going to turn me into a Power Ranger. If this thing is going to turn me into a Power Ranger, then I need a normal looking phone, man. Like, like if you're going to give me the bottom out camera and all this other nonsense, like, oh, well, it's... well, we'll have to see June 12th, both Vivo and Lenovo are making an announcement for the next phone and the Z5. So I, we'll I see, think, see what the. This Z5 looks awesome, but I think it's upside down. I think Vivo is on a better track. I think yeah. in terms of design, I, I know that moving parts in a phone aren't necessarily practical. That's probably going to be a failure point into a year of life. But I, I think Vivo's track is actually more encouraging for what we could do with this kind of all screen look. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. And one more thing, uh, WWDC is on... Nobody cares. Monday... <laughs> Uh, the fourth, uh, not much in terms of rumors. We knew that, of course, there'll be a new iOS, iOS 12. Um, there's also going to be some improvements to Mac OS. Doesn't look like there's any hardware. We might get some Apple TV updates and stuff like that. Anything you expecting, Juan? Any? Uh, 
Oh, sorry, oh. Warren, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'm wondering if this is where we'll maybe we'll get the the point where they can combine Mac OS and iOS to be one thing. I don't, I don't see that shit happening anytime soon. I I went, I'm not putting it past them. The, the, just, I mean, in terms of a name, like they just yeah. don't, they just don't, they just don't make it a difference between anything. iOS runs but, all things that but are I'm, Mac. I'm, with, I'm really with you there, Warren, because what I really hope Apple will do soon is revive the MacBook division, have a MacBook and a MacBook Pro and a MacBook Air, but make the MacBook more of an iPad clamshell laptop experience. Use that as the wedge to start moving Mac and iOS, uh, Mac OS and iOS more into the same arena. I, I think we're seeing, especially with Qualcomm, what, Qualcomm just announced the, or we, we've got word on a Qualcomm 1000 or something that's supposed to be a more ARM-based mobile chipset, but for more desktop style grade computing. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple already has a monster of a chipset in their A series. There's really very little holding them back from from moving forward. I thought they were way too early with the experiment of calling an iPad a pro. But what I'm currently doing on my phones in terms of of high end production computing, uh, Apple could move the needle on something like that. A lower I mean, cost I MacBook with an A series chipset that has more functionality of, of Mac OS, but is a more walled garden like iOS. That could be a really compelling product. Oh no, yeah, definitely. I see. I don't. I don't think their processor, the A chipset, as powerful as it is for mobile, I don't think it's attuned to any of that desktop experience. I mean, like like oh, Mac OS no, desktop. I don't think it has the power for it. I think it, it, it would be it would weird. be Apple putting it, it would be Apple putting a skin on iOS. Yeah, Seriously. exactly. Yeah, that would yeah, yeah, yeah. Be no, it. totally. So you make a low cost MacBook. But it's basically just an iPad with a wrapper and a built-in hinge keyboard, mm -hmm. and then you can make that design more like a like a Lenovo um, uh, Yoga, yoga. Mm -hmm. and we would finally have what that that Apple experience that we've been begging them for of some type of multi-mode two-in-one tablet and laptop kind of uh, setup, and then they that also you know gives Apple the 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 cred to say we were right about the app. And the iOS based ecosystem being the right move, because look, we, we also built it into a laptop and we did something revolutionary that everyone has already done but us. <laughs> but um, but that to me would be a meaningful change. Yeah, you give it, you give it you are support. right. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, what was that, Sam? No, I'm saying, yeah, you are right. It's when you start hearing news about, um, you know, about Google removing um, tablets. tablets from yes. the Play Store. Then it's like, oh, maybe Apple's the only gaming town to give you something like that. that that's an actually very great observation, man. Well, I need, I need them to do one thing. It would be the most revolutionary thing ever, and that's group-style notifications. Yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God <laughs> Uh, they got two thousand eighteen. Warren, Warren, it just works. It it just works. It just it's works to miss your messages. Phone. Yeah, totally. No, my my iPhone ten has like mess notifications from that, out the yin yang, and I'm just like, well, now I, now I see why iPhone uses miss messages and miss calls. Okay, yeah, can't blame can't blame anymore. It is so like it's so bad. It's you it's, know, and, and people like you can clear it. I mean, it's not even that easy. Just say there's no clear all. There's no official. Where's there a clear all? There's no clear Why can't all. Group together. No, no. You see, iOS is just super intuitive. That's the way they've always done it. So that's how it's intuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm trying to figure out how to turn off notifications on my tablet here because I don't need it for notifications. <laughs> <And> <laughs> those notifications are definitely difficult. No, I, 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 mean, I don't touch that. I just kind of swipe up and unlock the phone, and I'm like, I'm, I'm good. Well, if somebody messaged me. Oh well, have a nice day. Maybe I'll see womp, it. Womp. Maybe I won't. Womp, yeah. Womp. Yeah. Uh, unlike Android users who are more productive, get your message <laughs> and actually know when it's been sent to them. Yeah, so that is true. Clear out the bullshit messages. Easy. But but yeah, so so to your point though, Warren, I, I would hope to see some move in that direction. I, I think app de developers are taking the app ecosystem seriously enough that I'm getting into some pretty advanced stuff. Uh, you know, on Android, doing really high high quality audio recordings with dedicated USB hardware, uh, plugging in wireless microphones and interview style equipment. Uh, capturing extremely high quality video, writing the script from the phone, editing, rendering, and uploading 4K video. I think we're ready. We're, 
I think we're there. It, it's just now we kind of need a few other pieces like like with Sam, like you were talking about like decks. There's not much holding us back from really making the phone brain a main part of our overall computing experience to a much more meaningful degree. And I think if we can get just that one more generation on things like external GPUs, so I should be able to plug my phone into a dumb chassis that has a high-end CPU and GPU with desktop grade RAM and desktop grade storage, but my phone is still the brain. That's like the operating system that follows me around. We could make that transition happen in a meaningful way today, let alone where we might be in two or three years. Cool. <laughs> well, that's, that's new your minds. That is it for topics right here, guys. That, that was very um, last week tonight, John Oliver. Like, cool. <laughs> I, was, I was almost going for like Conan way back in the day. In the year 2000. Oh, that, that's right, way back. Um, so so one, one thing I wanted to ask you guys about, and, and if you think this will actually move the needle on, on services, you know, uh, AT&T playing games with the LG release, not picking up the G7, but they wanted their exclusive on the V35. And then it turns out to not really be an exclusive because those phones are going to be going to Project Fi. Mm -hmm. Do you think that adding more phones to Project Fi now is really going to move the needle? No. It, it helps Project Fi, which I think it is helps, thing. but it doesn't necessarily move the needle. It's nice to have more phones, but it doesn't move the needle. Uh, I think, to me, as much as the G7 is a nice phone, uh, the V35 is just more to my calling. There's no notch. It's got more RAM, if you want more RAM in there, and it's probably going to be priced the same. So, And it's got the you know 845 internals. Well, I mean, not, not, not in between the actual LG phones, because it's the G7, the V35, and then the new Moto G6. No, no, I'm saying I'm I'm saying that for AT and T to to select that that was oh, a smart okay. choice. But but I was saying but, more about more about Project Fi. Now it's not Pixel and Nexus. It's yeah, but think about that's a, a pretty big of, thing that we're getting a flagship phone that isn't technically some type of you know stock Android uh, or or Pixel like experience showing up on Project Fi, which is so the, the question with Project Fi, do they do any advertising at all? Is there anything very, that's very minimal, very, very, like, very minimal. Just go and saw some some print. Like I saw like a couple billboards and stuff. I think I saw some billboards, but um, it, it's very, very minimal. But the, but, but the fact, web advertising. But the fact that now on, on their site, you get the Pixel 2 and Pixel 2 XL, you get a Moto G6, an Android One Moto X4, an LG G7, then the Q and LG, I uh, think whatever the hell I think LG it's B25. A proper carrier. That's yeah. pretty good, and they've already kind of answered the uh, one of the calls for for unlimited data, which I think they don't charge you data over six gigabytes at this point now. Yeah, it's, it's sixty. Just, it's sixty dollars for unlimited. And if, so if it's, over, it's and then you also pay less if you don't go over six gigs of six, data. Six, yeah. And I and I use Project Five for a year and a half, and it was solid, solid service. Oh, yeah, I still use Project Five as my travel phone. It's, it's, it's a really, yeah, really it's, good service. Good coverage. It's basically, it's all now. It really is all T-Mobile and US Cellular because <laughs> right. with the Sprint merge. But even when I, even when I had Project Fi, I, I never used the Sprint side of it. I always there was there was ways to use codes to push it to only be on T-Mobile. Well, and so, I would also I just pop it into any unlocked phone, so I knew I wasn't ever gonna be <laughs> moved over to Sprint, Sprint anyway because it's not CDMA. Yeah, but that's a big that's a big thing to see happen. That that phone gets that. That makes me wonder if other other flagship is going to show up in there. Maybe like the HTC, the U12 may show up over there. Uh, you know, maybe Samsung throws one. Maybe Samsung throws a Galaxy on there or a Note on there at some point. Unlocked. I'm actually great really way, surprised. Great way to sell unlocked phones because this this is something that people from Project Five have been asking for a long time, which yeah. is. I want to use something other than a Pixel phone. I mean, yeah, it, it's to Google's benefit. I, it, to me, it just it just depends on how what Google is doing internally, how they see Project Fi, um, because you know, especially with Samsung, Samsung, like you mentioned, Samsung this year and and the last year, they they've been doing that big push of selling unlocked phones themselves. You know, you can mm -hmm. go to Samsung.com and buy it, and it would be Samsung would gladly like to say, yeah, you can use this on Project Fi. You're buying it unlocked anyway. You know, like. You know, buy our phones, um, and to me that would that would be a bigger push if a Galaxy were to show. Maybe the Galaxy Note because you know the the S nine is the S series is still the you know the big flagship, but a Note yeah, but, on there. But, but why not? Because you have you have things like uh, um, Xfinity Mobile that has the S nine on it, 
and has the iPhone 10 on. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not saying that it, it shouldn't come. I'm just saying that, you, like, for the initial announcement, a note will, you know, will be something you announce that, yeah, it's coming out also on Fi, but you also will add the S9 because it's already been out for a couple of months. Yeah. Um, so I think that is that is something. Just, but again, it all depends on what, the, you know, my thing with Fi and with any Google services that, and we've said in the past that I just just don't trust these guys in the sense that I don't know what how they will maintain, what they plan to do with some of these services. Are they going to decide to rebrand and do something else? It's Google. That's just the way it is. You know? yeah. so. Well, I think this is the part of Google that has that because they can't just go willy nilly with everything because is they, they, they rely rely on carriers for this that they're going to. They play. They've been towing the line more and going at a much more meticulous process. Like the really the only reason I switched off of Project Five is because I wanted a different phone, and then Unlimited Data came out for all the other carriers at that point in time. So it just became economically a little bit better to go on that side for myself. But th th truth be speaking, like you know, if we're starting seeing Morty's flagship showing on there, unlocked phones are more supported by the Project Fi um, spec, specifically since now that it's T-Mobile, Sprint, and um, US Cellular are on there, and most likely, um, you know, Sprint's going to get Sprint's going to get that boost in their LTE, and maybe you won't need that CDMA side of it. You know, you can just use any unlocked phone to use the service, and you're going to get very good coverage compared to anywhere else you're going to go and get all the features that you're looking for, simple billing and and, and, and such. It's like, it's going to be, that's pretty compelling uh, uh, for them, I, I think, in, in many ways. Not only problem, only problem Product 5 has is that the, the, the Hangouts team are a bunch of jerks. It's really, <laughs> it's really just a problem with that. It's yeah. because because Project 5 is really dependent on Google Hangouts for a lot of its features to work, which it probably uses it the best out of anyone in terms of, of in terms of of, uh, of using Hangouts, but it, it, and everything that it sort of incorporates with it, but they're also got another development team that's a bunch of big jerks about how Hangouts is, is being used. Uh, you know what, um, Aditya and Neil actually, you know, made a very good point that maybe the overall demand or the overall appeal of Samsung might be a, a negative because that would introduce more people to using Fi and that might you know, the grade, the quality of the service we already get on five. And I don't jump on that network. I don't know. I don't, I don't right. think so. And I, and, I, and I think that's because there's just not a lot of people that are going to want to take their own. There's not a lot of people that are smart enough to be able or want to waste the mental capacity on taking service into their own hands is what you would do with a project five. There's such a thing as in-person store and customer service that people still want to be able to go and do. That's and true. that's the one thing that the other carriers that will, that will have the advantage for. It's clearly not needed. I think we all know it's probably really not needed, but it's, there are people that just want that type of service. They want to walk in and just do that. That's why they create the member. Oh, have you been every carrier store now? If you go to it, that isn't some type of third party reseller is essentially an experience store. Yes, yeah. and and that's done because they because for those people that want to come into the stores. Well, no, it's because also Apple told us that experience stores work. <laughs> they, you know, and that's what people people want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People I mean, want people want it's, service. It's, it's kind of interesting because they, that they started. They stay. They started their experience, and then Best Buy kind of copied it. Then Best Buy essentially sold space inside of it. The Samsung also purchased to do the same thing, and then all the other carriers decided to do the same experience style stuff. Kind of after that fact. Yeah. But they, get, they got pissed at Best Buy Mobile, basically. <laughs> the story they decided to exist. Uh, well, I gotta actually take off, guys. So. Alrighty. I'll see you guys in the next one. All right. Later. All right. Later. Good one, man. Yeah, and uh, I guess on that note, we don't have anything else to add. Um, we can definitely round up the show unless you know anyone has any questions or say any comments. Yeah, what well, you got in the chat, guys? I mean, we've been seeing some some fun conversations. Some uh, a few people out there still uh, still fronting for services like Straight Talk. Um, the Straight Talk still looks like it's a, a really competitive MVNO. Um, I've got a couple family members on Ting. Uh, I know I still have a couple friends on Republic. I mean, th this is this MVNO space has been really competitive of late. Cool. All righty. No, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a slow uh, week. It's a slow week. All right. Um, all right. Cool. We've come to that point of the show where we tell you 
what we have on the channel and what you can expect next week. Uh, I will do warrants for you. He's got stuff on the channel and you can expect more stuff next week from bw1.com. And uh, Mr. You, Mr. I said Mr. You, <laughs> and you, Mr. Juan Magnell. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, a couple things. Uh, recently, um, on Thursday, we did a new egg now on Father's Day tech. Some some fun ideas that, you know, you still got some shopping time left uh, to pick up a, a good gift for your dad. Uh, a couple days ago, we did the uh, another episode of the Geek Book Club um, where we talked about we revisited one of my favorite books when I was 12 um, just to see if it still held up. And it did OK. We did a Star Trek, The Next Generation Vendetta the giant novel there was a whole series of these little pocket books expanding the star trek universe not canon um but th they had this one pocket book which was 500 pages long so they called it the giant novel which is hilarious uh and then um i also produced i also published my review of the lg g7 uh just trying to take a trying to take a fresh look at this phone especially with some of the commentary coming out about pricing which i don't think has been entirely fair to the G7 when you've got an entire review that's just decided that for some reason it's not worth it because it's a little bit more expensive than a smaller Galaxy S9. So uh, I've got a review out on my channel there and then I have just finished the script. It's uh, 4,200 words on the G7's cameras and uh, so I'll be finishing that up over the weekend. You can be on the lookout for my full in-depth deep dive camera review for the g7 and that's going to go to patreon.com slash some gadget guy cool all right uh on my end uh we had of course our westworld recap show um we've got another episode coming up uh sunday episode seven join us 10 20 p.m it's a lot of fun discussing westworld uh in terms of tech videos we dropped our um i would say our uh I call it a bio, bio's guide to VR, looking at the four of the biggest VR headsets, the Mirage Solo from Lenovo, Oculus Go, the Gear VR, and of course the Daydream headset to see like not what's the best, but which fits you the best. So depending on where you are, what you're looking for, and price range. Um, we also had another PC build. It's our Ryzen 2600. It's a budget upgrade. It's a little different. Uh, this is showing you how you can easily upgrade a Ryzen processor uh, to 2600 is the second gen Ryzen. And you can upgrade from the very first generation. You can upgrade from an APU because AMD uses the same chipset for all of those. So it's a really, yeah, it's a really easy process to actually do that. Uh, and then we've got uh, two uh, mobile videos. One is our three-month review of the Galaxy S9 Plus. Um, I, this was a nice collab I did with Matthew Monez. He basically hijacked the video, and we just did this run and gun. Uh, when he was here in New York City. So that was cool to actually do that with him. And then uh, I did a complete walkthrough of the HTC U12 Plus. Just got to go through all the aspects of the device. Um, I will be doing more videos like this for certain devices that I don't have time to spend too much on. So I will just go through the whole thing for you guys. So if you like that, let me know. Uh, next week, uh, we will have a couple of videos. We have our audio battle. This one will include the uh, OnePlus 6, the uh, HTC U12 Plus, as well as also the Sony Xperia Z. So three new phones we, that claim that they have some really good sound in terms of speakers. We're going to be testing them out with our champion, the G7 ThinQ, and uh, the runner-up, the Galaxy S9 Plus, uh, maybe the iPhone since iPhone people will probably complain, hmm. uh, <laughs> which was third, you know, third place in that, that whole debate. Um, and then we'll also have, um, man, I forgot. Yeah. Anyway, some more videos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there will be more. I have a lot of videos coming up next week. It's going to be busy. Um, and uh, E3 is also around the corner. Uh, but before I wrap, I want to thank everyone uh for watching the channel we just hit 100 million views so thank you very much for you guys watching leaving comments cursing me out when i make mistakes that kind of stuff uh it's been fun and appreciate all the support of the year so thank you and uh 
definitely check out all the channels. Check out Mr. Warren Bowman at bw1.com. His channel is bw1 on YouTube. Uh, you can also find him on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, bw1.com. And then Mr. Juan Bagnell is some gadget guy on uh, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, he also hosts a show at 1 p.m. Um, East, 1 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays on Newegg, Newegg Now. Pretty fun show. Check it out. Lots of cool hardware. Uh, they've got some nice, great discounts once in a while. So you can also watch him uh, play VR games and, and dance. He used to be a very good dancer. They worked it in. They worked it in, man. I was yeah. stoked about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and finally, uh, Sam. You can find him on Twitter. It is Black Iron underscore Man, part of the Border Work Network. And myself, it is Border Work YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Thank you very much, guys. And always enjoy your entertainment. Bam.